Όταν πέρυσι είχαμε ζητήσει από τη Μελίσσα Φλέμινγκ να είναι ομιλήτριά μας στο TEDx Θεσσαλονίκη 2015, δεν μπορούσαμε καν να φανταστούμε τη θέση που θα έπαιρνε το προσφυγικό ζήτημα στις ζωές μας, όχι μόνο στην Ελλάδα και την Ευρώπη, αλλά και σε ολόκληρο τον κόσμο. Η ομιλία που έγινε πέρσι στο TEDx Θεσσαλονίκη από την Μελίσσα μετράει πάνω από ένα, σχεδόν 1,5 εκατομμύριο views μέσα από το κανάλι του TED. Και έχει βοηθήσει στο να δούμε ίσως οι περισσότεροι στο πρόσωπο της ΔΟΑ, τα πρόσωπα όλων αυτών των ανθρώπων, οι οποίοι αναγκάζονται και φεύγουν από τη χώρα τους, στην προσπάθειά τους και με την ελπίδα να μπορέσουν να ζήσουν σε μια καθημερινότητα που δεν θα είναι κάτω από τη διαρκή απειλή πολέμου. Η ΔΟΑ στάθηκε τυχερή και γενναία, καθώς ήταν μία από τους ελάχιστους επιζήσαντες από ένα τραγικό ναυάγιο που συνέβη το 2014 στη Μεσόγειο. Ευτυχώς, η ίδια επέζησε και μαζί της κατάφερε και έσωσε και ένα μωρό, παρόλο που η ίδια δεν ήξερε κολύμπη. Η Μελίσσα Φλέμιγκ ήθελε πάρα πολύ να είναι σήμερα μαζί μας και να μοιραστεί το υπόλοιπο της ιστορίας. Δηλαδή, τι έγινε με την ΤΟΑ, πού βρίσκεται σήμερα και τι κάνει. Επειδή όμως οι υποχρεώσεις της στα Ηνωμένα Έθνη δεν τις επέτρεψαν να βρίσκεται σήμερα μαζί μας, μας έχει στείλει ένα μικρό βίντεο, το οποίο θα ήθελα να παρακολουθήσουμε όλοι μαζί. Hello friends at TEDx Thessaloniki. Hello Elena. Really great to be with you again, though only virtually. I wish I was there in person. Uh, Elena asked me to let you know what has happened since the la I was on stage this time last year delivering a talk about Doha Al-Zamal, the heroic Syrian refugee young woman who survived the worst, one of the worst shipwrecks on the Mediterranean Sea. 500 people died and she managed to save a baby girl after four days on the water and watching the love of her life, uh, her fiancé, Bassam, die in front of her eyes. Um, this was a tragic yet very hopeful story, a story that has inspired so many people. Um, I'm writing a book about her story. And um, one of your, the fellow speakers um, at the conference last year, Alexis uh, Panatsis of Hellas Direct, the company Hellas Direct, was also inspired by Doa's speech, and he um, and his company awarded her a very generous scholarship, which really helped her. She's now been resettled with her family to Sweden, and she's putting it towards her education. It's, it's really uh, helping her to start her new life. I think it inspired his company and also his clients as well, not just to hear about the usual story of large numbers of Syrian refugees, other refugees arriving on the shores of Greece. No other country has received so many refugees, but a single story, a single story that um, inspired him and inspired uh, his, his fellow. I met all of uh, his company. I went to visit them in Athens, a you know, wonderful group of people who just said, how can we help? And I really think this company, and by doing so, I show that if you help one individual, Um, you're telling a larger story, you're helping that person a lot, but you're also, it has an echo and a ripple effect. Um, it, it, it shows that, you know, one person, one company can do an influence a lot. Um, private sector is doing a lot to help in the refugee crisis. This is a crisis that is the worst um, since World War II. We have 60 million people forcibly displaced. And no time since World War II have we had so many people on the run. Governments can't do it alone. And as you see, uh, you're sitting in Thessaloniki, very close to the border of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The countries are reacting um, in ways now which is shutting people off rather than embracing them. We're see hearing wonderful stories of individual actions by local Greece, Greek citizens. I can't even tell you. I read one a day, and it really warms my heart. A, a baker um, in Idomini who took in families uh, in, in his home because he couldn't stand to see them suffering uh, in the cold. Um, one after the other, these kinds of stories, private companies coming in uh, to provide food, Uh, shelter, uh, local NGOs, filling in the gaps of governments. I think um, we're at a time right now where the compassion 
um, is losing out over the fear that is taking over, um, the fear that's being exploited by um, politicians who are really worried, uh, more worried about losing their power than they are about protecting people who are fleeing from war and per persecution. So all I wanted to say is thank you for this opportunity um, to speak. Who would have known um, last year at this time that Greece would become the cent center stage for the biggest refugee crisis um, that the world has seen in a long time? Um, it is a really, really difficult humanitarian situation right now in Greece, and I really thank you all uh, for caring and for doing your part. Thanks, and have a great uh, TEDx Thessaloniki 2016. Η Μελίσσα ήθελε πραγματικά να είναι εδώ και να μοιραστεί αυτά τα δυο λόγια, οπότε θεώρησα ότι αυτό το βίντεο θα είναι μια πολύ ωραία ευκαιρία να δούμε και εμείς τι συμβαίνει όταν κλείνουν τα φώτα στο TEDx Θεσσαλονίκη, όταν πλέον έχουμε ακούσει όλες αυτές τις ιστορίες, τι μας αφήνουν, τι μας προτρέπουν, τι μας εμπνέουν ίσως να κάνουμε, έτσι ώστε ο καθένας από εμά με τον τρόπο που μπορεί και έτσι όπως επιθυμεί, να κάνουμε κάτι για να συμβάλλουμε στον κόσμο μας. Και σε συνέχεια της Μελίσσα, πέρσι είχαμε προσεγγίσει τον Αλέξη Πανταζή, στον οποίο αναφέρεται, για να είναι ο μιλητή μα στο τέδε της Θεσσαλονίκη. Και τον προσεγγίσαμε μέσα από την επιχειρηματική του δραστηριότητα στην Ελλάς Direct. Οπότε, όταν ήρθε να μιλήσει και ξεκινήσαμε τις συζητήσεις αρχικά μαζί, αναμέναμε ότι θα είναι μια ομιλία που θα αφορούσε την επιχειρηματικότητα. Ωστόσο, ο Αλέξης μας ευνηδίασε, νομίζω, όλους ευχάριστα και επικεντρώθηκε σε ένα άλλο κομμάτι, το οποίο είναι σημαντικό από ό,τι υποδείχθηκε στην επιχειρηματικότητα, και αυτό αφορά την νοοτροπία. Ε, και επικεντρώθηκε στην νοοτροπία του πρόσφυγα και του μετανάστη, στο να δημιουργεί ευκαιρίες και γιατί όχι να πετυχαίνει. Οπότε, όντας παρόν ο Ελέξ Πανταζής πέρσι στο TEDx Θεσσαλονίκη, γνωρίστηκαν με τη Μελίσσα, όπως και με τους υπόλοιπου ομιλητέ και θέλησε ο ίδιος να κάνει κάτι για να βοηθήσει ή να συνεισφέρει με τον τρόπο του και μέσα από την εταιρεία του. Ο Αλέξ Πανταζής έχει έρθει σήμερα εδώ μαζί μας και θα ήθελα να τον καλέσω στη σκηνή να πούμε έτσι λίγο δύο πράγματα και να μοιραστούμε μαζί σας τη συνέχεια τη συνεργασία του ή της προσφοράς του, αν θέλετε, στην ιστορία της ΔΟΑ. Αλέξη. Καλώ ήρθες. Χαίρομαι πολύ που έχουμε κοντά μας. Γενικότερα, οι περισσότεροι αναρωτιόμαστε τι συμβαίνει. Ερχόμαστε σήμερα σε αυτή την αίθουσα, ήμασταν 700 άτομα μέσα στο κτίριο, γνωριζόμαστε, ακούμε ιδέε, εμπνεόμαστε. Και μετά, όταν φεύγουμε από την αίθουσα, τι συμβαίνει. So, would you like to explain us briefly what happened when you met with Melissa and how did this whole uh, story uh, became related to a last direct? Last year, uh, the last but one speaker was myself and the last one was Melissa. And as I was finishing my talk and I started walking towards the back, um, Melissa, who I spent quite a bit of time with, clearly because we're the only ones stuck there, um, <laughs> we, we talked a lot about the And as, as she started coming onto the stage, I could actually observe from the side, I didn't manage to get to my seat, from the side, the facial expressions of all the people in the audience. And I don't know how many of you guys were here last year, but Melissa gave a very touching, emotional speech uh, about the story of Doha. And what I've realized in the one day, more or less, that we spent together with Melissa is that the story of Doha represents a number of stories, I would say thousands or even millions now, of stories of refugees. And one of the things that I noticed as I was coming through the curtain onto the main, row, the, the main room was that people were actually crying. And what I've realized is that if we give an example, which is a human person of a big tragedy like the one we're going through now, to normal people like myself, yourselves, everybody who was in that room, then people can relate to it, and they can relate to it more. So we, we spoke with Melissa at the dinner afterwards, and you know, it was a pretty emotional moment because she, she gave a really amazing presentation. And I asked her, so what's going on with Doha? Because that was last year. She, survived four days into the sea. She saved one life. She was granted the award of bravery, if I remember well, 
from the Athens Academy. And Melissa said that, well, unfortunately, there was a lot of hype when everything happened. There was a lot of headlines in the press. There was a lot of talk. They invited her to different events. And then slowly but steadily, as these things go, nobody really cared. And Melissa and her team did an amazing job in trying to get her to get some legal papers in order to go to Sweden, which was her end goal. But Doa was going through a bit of a rough patch. She wasn't really feeling positive about the future. The whole experience had sunk in. She couldn't see uh, an opportunity for her to be able to go abroad and continue what she set out to do with her fiance at the time, who unfortunately died in the, in the wreck. And that was to study. She wanted to study to be a lawyer in order to fight injustice in the whole world. So speaking with Melissa, I was trying to figure out, is there a way that I as an individual or we as a company, we could help in this? And we, we feel quite strongly about giving scholarships, and, and, and we've done so since the day that Emilio's my business partner, and I founded the company. But is it possible that we can get involved in this? And Melissa was very, very supportive in this. We started talking. Uh, the whole process took about six months. Uh, Marilora, who works with me, spent a lot of time speaking with Melissa on what's the best way to do it. And then you stumble into Greek bureaucracy, where <laughs> in order to give money, it's even harder than to make money. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't know whether we should give the money to Melissa, to give the money to Doa. Doa didn't have an account. So we went through a lot of back and forth. But I, I think for us, the, the, the bottom line was that we decided that we're going to use Doa's story as a symbol, as a small gesture on our part to follow on from the spirit of TEDx Thessaloniki last year, grant her the scholarship for the degree that she really wanted to do. As you heard from Melissa before, um, Doa is now in Sweden, so that's great yes. news for everybody. And we just wanted to signal to other companies, individuals, organizations, that if everybody does their own little bit, then we can really make a difference. So your personal motive, or the motive of Elast Direct, was basically to make a difference in any way that you thought would be possible? Or? I, th I think for us it was, um, it was a combination of two things. The first one is, in what we do as a company, we're trying to change the way our industry, which is the insurance industry, is being done. So we're trying, as we say, to rethink the whole chain. And we heard a lot of good stories before, whether it's from Alex uh, Loezo, to talk about the buy-in of the whole company behind a culture. So for us, it's almost what we do in all other aspects of our lives. So this was just an extension mm -hmm. on the corporate social responsibility side. Now, on that one, from the day we started the company, we've given a number of scholarships. We gave two scholarships to people to go and study in London uh, at the City University. We gave two scholarships to kids of policemen because we felt that that, as a group, were not rewarded enough for the contribution that they did, at least in road accidents, mm -hmm. which is what we really care about. Um, we've given a number of research grants, so the, the fact that we managed to divert some of these efforts onto DOA on, in this case, I think just sent an extra message of mm -hmm. maybe we can think a bit differently as an organization. Yeah. Do you believe that the appropriate attitude for either companies or for civil society actors um, in crisis of such magnitude as we are going through at the moment, um, what do you think would be like the right or more appropriate kind of mindset that we would need to maybe adopt or try? Mm. I think as a mindset, everybody has to react in the way that they seem fit. And everybody's values differ, whether it's on ethical levels, or on ideological levels, or financial levels, or any other way. I think one of the things that we're realizing now, especially in the European Union, is that we cannot expect things to be done by the state mm. or by the European Union as a union. And everybody has different agendas, everybody has different capabilities, different political beliefs, so individuals and companies have a much more important role to play. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in this part of the world, and Cyprus, where I'm from, is exactly the same, is we tend to rely a lot on the role of the state, that this is not my problem, they will do it. And this day and age, this doesn't seem to work. So I think any contribution on that is at least changing gradually the mentality of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going back to your talk, and actually the message of your talk, was you basically concentrated saying that what it takes is a different kind of mindset that usually refugees uh, or immigrants uh, tend to have, and that has a positive effect on the economy of a country and maybe in evolving uh, the society of the country. Do you think that we are actually going through a, ki uh, a same kind of situation either in Greece or in Europe? 
because basically we're more or less under the same terms. I mean, we, mm. we have a lot of immigrants or refugees that are going through our countries. No. Is this um, same type of kind of opportunity that we may be facing with? I think it's a huge opportunity, but the one thing we need to do as, as Europeans and as global citizens is how do you turn what is now a humanitarian crisis into a full integration of these people into societies? And I'm not talking about a flattening of cultures, religions, and all that, and languages, but I'm really talking about how can we get these Syrian people coming in um, and integrate them in a way that they're productive, that their social cohesion actually works. When you look at the demographics of the European Union and you compare them to the immigrants coming in, they're very different. Yeah. We're an aging, dying continent, and suddenly you have an influx of very young, capable people. And clearly some of them are poor and uneducated, some of them are doctors and whatever. So I think there's a lot of value that these people can bring. You will always have xenophobia in these situations. Um, I, I, out of interest, I was looking at what was the reaction of people when the Vietnamese refugees in the 1970s came into, into the US and what happened when you know, the, the, the Jewish population after the Second World War, they went into, well, Cyprus of all places at that time for a holding camp Mm -hmm. similar to what you have in yeah. Idomeni now, before they went to the newly formed Israel. And when you look at some of the headlines of the papers, they're exactly the same oh, as they are now. So it's people like Donald Trump saying, I'm going to build a wall. <laughs> it's exactly that reaction. So I think, to your point, I think some of these reactions are very natural. Yeah. Some of them, you could even argue that some of them are justified. Um, but yeah, in the middle to long term, I think I'm very optimistic about what is happening mm -hmm. now. Okay, one last question. What would you respond to any criticism that these kind of initiatives, like you uh, took through your company, some say that it's sheer marketing. Hmm. What would you respond to such a, a respond? <laughs> I wish it was in a sense, but it's... No, I, I think there's two <laughs> angles there. Um, the first one is that I think you can see the culture of a company just from, you cannot, in this day and age, you cannot lie about what your culture is as a company. Whether it's Tom Shoes giving things out as you purchase their products, whether it's, um, you know, a, a, a coffee or a, or a bread uh, mm -hmm. manufacturer in, in Kenya. I, I think you can see through both the entrepreneurs and the culture of the overall company. So I think on this one, people can judge for themselves. I think at the same time, though, in a very cynical way, if efforts like this one are driven um, by marketing dynamics for different companies, and that means that companies do much more uh, because they believe that it helps their image and it's something that unless they do, the competition will get in front of them and all that, then by all means. I mean, it ends up mm -hmm. in, a, in a broader good. So on this one, yeah, that, that's <laughs> what I would answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.